while you're sitting there in that soft, comfy chair, well, I hope it's comfy, just try this with me. In your mind, zoom out. Picture yourself standing on a satellite, orbiting a planet somewhere in the galaxy, looking down on a world. It's bright and it's beautiful and it's colorful. Now imagine in this world, the people choose to live in large groups, thousands and millions of families, with thousands and millions of children and elderly. Where these people reside, there are dedicated public gathering spaces, parks and vacant lots, play spaces, creeks and rivers, beaches, conservation areas, community gardens, hills, mountains and other green spaces. And all of these are interconnected by well-maintained roads, bike paths and walkways. Now imagine the people choosing to live in these super-sized villages, amassed together, they're born with this innate hunger to connect with each other. Imagine the neighbourhoods, the social gatherings, the sense of community, the citizens together, hopeful, leaning on each other, trusting and accepting each other. Imagine such a world. It is a great paradox of this modern world that we have created. At no other time in human history have we lived together in such large groups. And at the same time, we've never been so socially disconnected, so isolated. It's like we're living a million miles apart. 30 years ago, it would have sounded absolutely ludicrous to create an organization whose mission was to encourage outdoor play and connection to nature, but then, it was a very, very different world. Yet here we are, and Nature Play Queensland is one of several Australian organisations, and there are many of these all across the globe who have tasked themselves with the mission to make outdoor free play a normal part of a child's life again. The difficult reality is that the world is moving at such a rapid pace, and identifying, let alone solving the issues, is like a huge investigation. We are constantly researching to find the culprit behind the death of the neighbourhoods as we once knew it. Only 10% of children play in natural spaces now. And that was 40% just 20 years ago. Central to this journey, central to this process that we call childhood, is the gradual transfer of risk management responsibilities from adults to children. Giving of freedoms, giving of everyday licences children but we've gotten confused about this process there has been a continuous gradual but overall enormous decline in children's opportunities to play and explore freely it's away from adults that children learn to become adults it's away from adults that children learn how to solve their own problems when there are not adults around doing it for them how can we give our children a childhood that helps them grow up to be happy, healthy, strong, kind, and resilient. Because you can't do it on a couch and you can't do it inside a house. You actually need to get our kids back outside and engaged in playful activities that allow them to grow. The reduction of children's freedom to move about, through, around their communities is a recent phenomenon. Professor Karen Malone, a leading researcher and authority on children's independent movement, indicates that Australia and the United States children are amongst the least free in the world. So, this is what it's come to. My name is Hayano. I'm the program manager for Nature Play Queensland. What started out as just a job has become my life's passion. Along this journey, I have come to question the significance of the neighbourhoods and the role that they play in our children's lives. Do kids really need a neighbourhood anymore? If so, what can we do to reactivate neighbourhoods for children to play? What are the missing pieces of the puzzle?
In 2018, the Neighbourhood Play project was conceived. And in April that year, we were preparing the first steps of the process, a Neighbourhood Forum. To begin our journey, we head north of Brisbane to a typical South East Queensland neighbourhood, which we have chosen completely at random. This neighbourhood has all the ingredients of a familiar urban Australian suburb. So myself, along with my awesome Nature Play Queensland colleague Miranda, hosted a forum to hear from the community about their concerns, specifically around the neighbourhood for their children. Do kids need a neighbourhood anymore? This is very much a community conversation. Community conversation means you got to talk to me. We did have another agenda up our sleeves. Hopefully, we might find some brave parents who are willing to invite us into their neighbourhoods to see if we can activate their communities as a place for their children to play. How do we find the balance for our kids again? How do we give them our kids their neighbourhood back? How do we find that balance between the screen time and the green time? Our neighbourhoods are our children's first wider place outside of the home. Kids are gonna be curious. They're gonna to wanna to know what's out there and they're gonna to wanna to connect to it. Think back to your childhood. I want you to think back to some of your most favorite memories that you had. If in those memories you were not outdoors, could you sit down? Everybody's still standing. Stay standing if you had a neighborhood full of children and you can access it at any time pretty much that you wanted. Stay standing if your children can do that today. This is a piece of research done on four generations of in one family growing up in one area. And these are the roaming distances. This is the great grandfather. He could roam six miles, which is 10 kilometers as an eight-year-old. These are all eight-year-olds. And then the grandfather, I don't know what happened. His world just got really small. And then the mother's got even smaller, and the son now can go 300 yards. The roaming distance for these guys shrunk over 95%. So what's happening for this child? That's not happening for this child. What's this kid's sense of community? I like the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. But then I wonder, what is the, what do we think a village is these days? Do we have villages? Do we have communities, neighborhoods that support a child? What are our connections? What are the quality of our connections in our neighbourhood? I live in a street called the Sack that's got about eight homes in it and you never see a person because they drive in the street, they hit the remote, the door goes up, they drive in, everybody gets out, the door goes down and you don't see anybody, you don't see any children. And there's children in every house. Yeah. So you just do not see them. My yes. parks are not safe where we live. I've found their needles numerous times. So yes. why would I let my child play there? I think people are really more cautious about leaving their kids out to play mm. because of who's around the neighbourhood. And your children don't just go home on their own from exactly. school. They have to go to after school mm. care. Yeah. Our generation, mums didn't work. Yeah. So you didn't want to be inside with mum. <laughs> <laughs> As the night progressed, it seemed like we'd uncovered a whole spectrum of barriers and concerns that these parents are facing in getting their kids to do something as simple and easy as go outside and play. How worried are you about children not having a neighbourhood and having access as an outdoor play resource? This is, this is completely, this is not at all worried. I think, you know, we can achieve amazing things if we put our minds to it. People are hungry for community. It's a quite a complex world for us out there now. A lot of pressure for parents to be a lot for their kids, where we just simply just went out and played, just by pure accident. I don't think my parents thought this deeply about any of this. <laughs> Somehow we've got to bridge this divide. And I don't know the answers. I really don't. I, know, I just know it takes hard work and effort, and a bit of trust. And I would like to keep adding to that. <laughs> good, good. Sustainable behaviours are just not fostered if we don't get kids outside. They, yeah. they don't make that connection that this is something important to preserve. <laughs> so after a very successful evening, we received 16 applications from families who want to be a part of this project. We have now narrowed it down to two very different neighbourhoods. On one hand, we've got Tracy in the brand new Riverbank Estate. In fact, this community is still under construction with a high density housing 
on an average block size of 400 square metres, with a very small backyard. Originally from New Zealand, Tracy moved to the area and lives with her husband Andrew and their children Sarah, who's 16, and James, who's six years old. I think it's really important to be part of this project because I really want my children to experience what I did when I was a child and being out there interacting with other people that they don't know um, and making building that friendship within the community that with the children that they're going to grow up with. And then we have Marissa. Marissa lives in Rangeview Estate, a well-established semi-rural suburb. She lives there with her family on a quarter acre block with huge backyard and lots of space to move. Her husband is Graham, and their two young children are Mayla, who is eight, and Zayden, who is four. I think if we fast forwarded five years and the kids were all out on the street and playing, I think they'd feel a more community, connectedness to our community. In five years time, the benefits for my son personally, I think will be he'll have a group of friends, he'll have social skills, he'll have a, a feeling of belonging in his community. There's not many kids playing, well there's no kids really playing out on the street. Air, occasionally you may see um, some kids coming past, like doing a walk through um, on their scooters or bikes, um, but it's not often that you would see kids out about. I think it is possible that kids can go out and play independently, and I think we can get to that point, but as a community we all need to come together to do that. Taking these next steps, I'm, I'm I'm definitely excited. Um, I, I am a little bit worried with the time factor as well because I am a vi very busy person too. Um, so I'm hoping it's going to be like, like I want everybody to get involved and stuff and not just something that people, that it's just sort of left on me to do, to create. Concerns I have about my child um, playing out in the neighbourhood is um, predators in the area. Um, bullying um, and traffic. Yeah, I feel like parents are, are scared. I get, I'm scared because <laughs> it's just that, I don't know, that, that unknown. Uh, I think the fear case for my parents, you didn't have social media, you didn't have all these different ways of reporting, so everything we hear now was probably still happening when we were kids, but it just wasn't reported. For me not to be scared, I, I, I don't know, maybe more people getting on board, yeah, having more kids together. I think there's been some really major cultural shifts. The first is the move from large to small families. That's a really obvious one. So, you know, a couple of generations ago, people had three, four, six kids. Now it's one or two. I think the birth rate's about 1.8 in Australia. So, you know, it's one or two maximum. So kids tended to travel in packs. And even if it was siblings uh, or cousins or friends or what have you, they traveled in packs. There is absolutely safety in numbers. There's no question of that. Uh, in terms of their social development, you know, we are definitely seeing more socially stunted children. Parallel playing in a sand pit at the age of three mightn't seem terribly important to the average parent, but I can assure you by the time that child gets to say 15, 16, they will have needed to have developed, you know, complex psychological uh, factors like theory of mind, which builds into empathy. That's the ability to understand that another person has a different point of view to mine. and. I think it's interesting. I think we're seeing already a, a lessening of theory of mind and empathy in the young adult population. We're seeing that polarisation, say, in politics. Everyone's madly left wing or madly right wing. And they're very bad at seeing the perspective of another person. So, you know, if you sort of stop kids from socialising with a very wide and diverse group of people, you will stop the development of probably one of the most important skills that a child and an adult can ever have. So, what better way to get to know your neighbours than to organise a Play Street event at your local park? We joined our neighbourhood play champions and we walked their neighbourhood with the mission of trying to find children who will come with us to celebrate their neighbourhood. Do you reckon they'll have kids here, Zayden? He maybe looks like a poppy. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. No kids? So, uh, Mayla and Zayden and their mum Marissa have just finished giving us a, a fantastic tour of their incredible neighbourhood. There seems to be lots of kids. I think we 
may have counted around 40, but we didn't see any. 16. 16 names already. Okay. So 16 houses? A whole, oh. a whole one of these and then um, we've got three more. How many people do you want to come to the party? Heaps. As many as possible? Uh-huh. Yeah, and why is that? Um, because there are more friends you can make. Cool. This is, you know, peak school holiday time and as you've seen from looking around, there's no kids out really. We found two kids at a park, we went to another park, there was no kids there. And, um, poor James is peering through everyone's fences and windows and car doors to look for signs of children. And Any kids down there? He really had a hard time. There seems to be like all the shutters are down, the windows are closed, the doors are all shut, and everyone seems pretty locked up in their houses and yeah. And then if you smell it, it'll smell like lemon. I think what contributes to the being not very visible is maybe the backyards. A lot of people in our street have that um, bigger backyard that they can go out in. Also I think technology would play a big part, like a lot of kids may come home and watch TV. If they don't get the social interaction and getting out there um, learning to interact with people that live around them as well, then there's going to be that whole um, stigma around that, you know, you're there, you live in your house, that's it, you don't interact with people outside of, outside of your home. It's really got all the ingredients. All the ingredients are here again for a really good neighbourhood. Stacks of green spaces with heaps of cool little adventure spots, lots of pathways, parks, and Amazing wetland, narrow streets, so cars can't go super fast. Really looking forward to seeing if we can help Marissa and her kids. It's going to be really interesting to see how Tracy goes activating this neighbourhood as a place to play because it's, uh, it's got all those right ingredients. There's so much potential for this amazing neighbourhood to be just a play heaven for children. Hi, Mr. Bright Bob Allison. I was watching you. I believe that the best way to assess the health of any society, the health of any nation, is by looking at the health of its local neighbourhoods. After all, we, we humans are social beings. We absolutely rely on communities, neighbourhoods, families to nurture us and support us, uh, give us a sense of security and even a sense of our own personal identity, that's, that's something that makes no sense without a social context. When there is a threat to social cohesion, when there is a risk of greater social fragmentation, and in fact psychologists and medical practitioners are now saying that social isolation represents a greater threat to public health than obesity does, uh, clearly, something is going on uh, in neighbourhoods and local communities around Australia that, that should be a really loud, clanging warning bell, uh, alerting us to the fact that we are all at risk from more fragmented communities, but most especially our children are at risk. While we wait in anticipation for our Play Street days, we took this time to hit the streets and get more of a feel for what the general population's thinking about our neighbourhoods. Down around Brisbane, we chose four different suburbs to explore. To find some parents to talk to, first, we must find some children. So, we set our sights on these neighbourhoods and went off on a good old-fashioned child hunt. Here we go, child hunting. So what we're looking for is any signs of children, trampolines, bikes. We're seeing any. There's no kids out on the street, that's the obvious thing, right? No, mate. 
This might seem like a strange question, but do you have children? Alrighty. Do you know if there's any kids that live in this area? Oh, cool. All right. Thanks, man. There's gotta be kids in this area, right? Children make up one quarter of the Queensland population. How would they know where to find each other? There's absolutely no signs. Maybe people aren't having children anymore. Maybe it's, this is the end of our species as we know it. We've got all these X-Men figures. Yeah, superheroes all lined up. See, oh. the window on the right. <laughs> oh. Our search for children and parents to talk to, it started off pretty slow. Big house. My name's Hayano. Uh, I'm a uh, work for a not-for-profit organisation. One of your parents at home? Oh, okay. She's got a headache. Fair enough, mate. Good on you for uh, not talking to strangers. I'll. Uh, thanks again. Actually, at first, it was a little intimidating trying to find someone who would let us in and have a chat about their neighbourhood play. Um. Okay. That's fine. It's done. It's totally up to you. Thank you very much. He was not into that at all. We continued searching for parents to talk to. Gradually, we found more parents. And once we broached the subject of outdoor play, we started finding all the barriers. I'm not comfortable with letting him walk without a friend. If he had somebody around the neighbourhood, I'd say the two of them go together. As they are growing up, they are more confined to uh, electronic devices, TV or iPads or something. Like. Games and a lot of TV channels and mobile phones. Oh, just if anything happened, if he fell over, if there was somebody, it's just that somebody approach you, it's teaching them the basics of life, like don't go to strangers. In general, maybe I think people are a little bit more vigilant, but as they grow, I'd definitely love them to have independence to roam. Well, the child hunting expedition across the four neighbourhoods, it wasn't very fruitful. And while we found a few parents to talk to, we didn't see many children out playing. So we decided to head to a local inner city park where we know children are allowed to roam wild and free. This is going to be a great spot to go child hunting. No, I think the kids are really busy with organised activities now after school rather than coming home and, uh, and just having time to themselves. But after school it would be generally around devices and stuff like that. Only on the weekends I'd get out into the bigger parks. Um, watching TV. Yes, iPad, we have a theatre, so we lo watch lots of movies in there. What's your favourite book? Uh, Minecraft. That's a book, is it? A guide yeah, book. It teaches them how to play Minecraft. Oh, wow. Come here. Come here. There goes my binoculars. I don't want to let my daughter go out to my neighbourhood and have a play because I, I know already what's there to happen. But back then in my neighbourhood, it was okay for me to have fun and whatnot. We can't do it these days? No, definitely not. I don't trust anyone these days. I would love for my children to play out on the street, but they're not allowed out there at all unsupervised. After a while, the harsh reality became evident to us. There certainly is a lot of fear for children's safety these I'm days. I'm older and I know, um, I know more things. I think it's an eye opener that, you know, you just don't know and it's very uncertain. And like that's the only bit that you sort of don't feel safe about because you don't know who's out there. Like if someone came up and talked to me randomly, I would get scared and worried of what they were gonna do or something like that. You see a story on the TV about stranger dangers, a, a kid taken off the side of the highway, all that sort of stuff. You know, that might only happen once every five or 10 years, but by crikey, we all remember it. You know, that, that it's, it's red alert and we've burned it into our brain and we, we're not very good at calming it down at all. At school, we do these talks and stuff about like stranger danger and if like anybody comes up to you and talks to you, you always scream and run to the nearest shops and get them to call your parents or something. Uh, I think we've done our children a huge disservice with the whole stranger danger concept. The idea that we would teach our children that a person is dangerous because you don't know them is absolutely the opposite of the lesson we should be teaching children if they are to become active, engaged members of local neighbourhoods and communities. Of course, we have to alert our children to adult behaviour that might be suspicious or might be dangerous 
But the idea that if you don't know someone, they are automatically assumed to be dangerous is a very, very dangerous message. Okay, so this particular neighborhood is, um, I suppose, uh, predominantly public housing and uh, um, predominantly lower socioeconomic um, area. But there definitely is lots of children and lots of signs of children here, actually more than we saw in uh, uh, the previous neighborhood we were in. Go and have a chat to these guys. Yeah, we we're, were looking for parents to have a quick chat to us about neighborhood play in your area. Oh, okay. Oh, it's awesome, yeah. This is there. <laughs> like hundreds of them come out. Do you mind if we have a chat with them? You guys go down to the park down the end of the road? Yeah. Really? Are you allowed to go there on your own? Mm, sometimes with our friends. Sometimes with your friends. But without but, an adult, are you allowed to go? Yeah. yeah. And you guys are obviously really sensible kids. You go mm -hmm. down there. What do you guys do down the park? Uh, we usually play Tiggy or like hide and seek. Then we go run and uh, go everywhere and then we can't go down there or we'll get stolen. And when our mum whistles, we go inside because then we know his oh, yeah. dinner is ready. Oh, did you say if you go down there, you'll get stolen? Wow. Yeah, because I told them that people will steal them. Yeah. Because they leave the street. Yeah. <laughs> What's the best part about this neighbourhood? Our friends us keep us safe and they be respectful. Oh, your friends keep you safe and respectful. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> You know, all the barriers and constraints are there and you've got a neighbourhood full of children playing out. It just goes to show that you don't have to buy into the fear. So there's still a level of fear there, but they still managed to carve out something really important for those children. Being able to connect and play. So, back to these neighbourhoods. The invites have gone up. The posters are up around the neighbourhood and now it's time for our Play Street event. So here we are, it's the big day. I'm super excited because today we find our communities for kids. Well, I'm hoping we find our community of families and children. The conditions are perfect for this area. What we need is our champions and we found those too. So now we need those guys to become super empowered and other people in the community to connect with them. And it says lemonade, lemonade. I believe today is going to be a successful day. Even if we only have a few families turn up, I think that once people see what, what's going on, then they may feel more comfortable to, to come out and to be a part as well, even if they were busy on the day, regardless what happens. Um, my kids are still going to have a really great day, so it's kind of like a giant party for them. It's just so wonderful to see um, a willingness to connect. You know, and, and a day like this is ideal because it's one thing to say, oh, it'd be great if our kids could, you know, have a community they could wander in. But until people actually show up and say, we're willing to do the work, you know, we're willing to connect here, you don't sort of believe it. So when, as I see people coming down, oh, it, it was a really, it's a positive um, feeling. It's an exciting feeling. What's the most dangerous thing that you guys do when your mum and dad aren't around? Popping wheelies on my bike. Jump out, I think. Um jump off high things, definitely, like yeah. waterfalls, high Probably. trees. Do your parents know about that, all that? Nah, no. <laughs> Is that the way it's going to stay? Yeah. yeah. We were selling um, lemonade and sometimes we got bored, but when we got bored we went on the flying fox. Well, what's going to happen after today? We'll be friends. And they'll be saying, I don't want to leave, I want to stay with my friend. <laughs> Before we started the Facebook page, I was feeling a bit uh, overwhelmed, like this was just not, people weren't going to grasp, like get on board. Um, the moment I created that Facebook page and started getting the comments from people, even just saying that this is a great idea, it sort of gave me that motivation to, to keep going. 
I think in terms of bridging the gap between neighbours and making friends, it really comes down to a sense of priority. I think we all feel like we're too busy, but really in essence it's just making it important. You know, it's making making the friendships that we establish a priority. So you're allowed to go like within your yard or maybe just a little bit further? Yeah. yeah. Oh no, not me, I'm allowed to go anywhere. Yeah, what if I asked your parents, would they say that? No, they'd say I'm allowed all up the, like up to a certain amount of the street, so like at the street ends, I'm not allowed to pass it. Well, that was a tough day at the office. Oh, and a massive success, right? So there's at least 12 or 13 families or over 20 children, maybe even 30 kids here. Lots of play, lots of connection, lots of talk. But it seems like there was only around three or four families from this actual estate. There are lots of people connecting from outside of the area which is okay, it's just okay. There's definitely a willingness to build on this and do more. And I think that is a um, really super positive thing. Today I'm feeling a little bit nervous, but really excited more than nervous. Whether it's a big group, a small group, um, I think you've got to start somewhere. And um, I think, yeah, if we can do that, that's gonna be a real big positive. And how many people do you want to turn up? 100 people. And so the park will be full of kids. It's a good start to get the kids to come out outdoors, you know. And there's three parks here now, so that's good. And I believe there's another one going to be built as well. These are really what I want to see in this area more of. That's why we brought here four and a half, five years ago now. Just because we thought, wow, this really could be a good family community area. We can help wherever we can with uh, new park embellishments or you know we've got a pop-up movie screen that we can loan out to people that have community events but it certainly doesn't start with me initially it has to start with the community itself and people like Tracy standing up and, and saying look I want to do something in my area. I show, I show yeah, how I get yeah. down. Uh, I, I wouldn't let my daughter go to any park on her own uh, as a young age. Um, Myself, when we were kids, we went everywhere. We walked everywhere and we never had an issue with anything, you know. I don't know, we used to play Spotlight till midnight. Things like that. You ma Imagine today's your kid coming up, a 10-year-old, I'm going to go play Spotlight till midnight. The parent would have a heart attack. In grade one, I used to walk to school and it would have been a good kilometre from where I live. We actually had to cross a creek. We were from the age of 10, 11, going surfing by ourselves without our parents. You know, and sometimes that creek would flood and top over, so one of the mums would be there to wade across the creek with us and help us to the school gate sort of thing. And I think now, would any parent allow their kid to orientee themselves to school like that, I, I doubt it, I'd, I'd struggle myself. You don't want to be overbearing too, you want him to be able to be, be himself, be a kid, mm. and you don't want him to rebel against you either by being overbearing. That's the first thing a teenager does when they've got overbearing parents. I want to be able to raise him in that way. I think it's really important to teach our kids to to be able to get from A to B across the planet. The other side of the coin is, just don't know what's out there. We had a gunman in our street two weeks ago. Whilst there is boogeymen out there and there's things to be scared of, I don't think they're around every corner and I, and I think you can take precautions to to, um, to to encourage it and so that the, they are safe, you know. I don't think you have to shut the door completely and lock them in the house, you know. A, a big theme for me through today was a lot of hope uh, that um, these guys can actually join Tracy and, and make this happen in this neighbourhood. I'm really grateful that the community came out today and that it's looking positive not just for the community but for my own children as well so I'm really excited about that. What a huge success! Heading into the next chapter we were really excited about the strong, real connections that we were making in Riverbank. So, along came our first workshop session. A Saturday morning seemed to be the general consensus, and we had 12 kids signed up, which was very promising. For Tracy, after several weeks and quite a considerable effort in networking and connecting, she was finally ready to see her plan come to fruition. We were all so excited to connect James with a neighborhood full of children to play. 
Unfortunately, however, for whatever reason, there was only one child and one parent that turned up. The aim of this session was really to speak to the parents while the kids got to know each other down at the park. What we needed was the parents' consent to take their children on a four-week journey and explore their neighbourhoods. Bit of a um, mixed feelings at the moment about today, I suppose. Um, I was uh, come up here um, thinking that uh, we'd have a whole group of families to talk to and a whole bunch of kids to work with. And um, we were, one mum showed up, and the, the, the others had sort of all fallen out. Some unknown reasons, I'm not sure what's going on. Regardless, we continue on with our session, determined to get some insight into how these parents feel about their neighbourhood. If I was to give you maybe three to five words to describe what your neighbourhood is for your children today. Quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Quiet. Um, yeah, definitely quiet. Lonely. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that there's kids around, but I know some of them just stay in their house, don't they? Yeah. They're like, do you not want them to play? And obviously, kids these days, a lot of them are on technology, and that's what's stopping them from going outside. If you ask them, would you like to go outside, they would prefer to go outside. But if there's not that option to go outside, then they're gonna go, well, I'll go on a device then. I'll go on technology. I'll do those things because I'm trying to fill my time with something. Having less people actually come to the meetings kind of makes it a little bit, a little, little bit disheartening. Um, on how we're going to move forward with the project, but it also just makes it more challenging as to what do we need to do in the community to actually get people wanting to get involved with um, the project that we're doing. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think for adults, because, you know, like I've said before, anxiety, social anxiety is such a huge thing now. Mm. Doesn't help that technology, you know, is kind of <laughs> driving that. But people don't know how to communicate anymore and they're scared of judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't it ironic that we have so many tools to communicate with? Yep. And our ability and quality of that communication is twinkling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not a destination, like we're never gonna reach a point where it's like, this is amazing, neighborhood for kids now. And to, to think that we could do it in, in four short sessions, you know, that, that we're still a bit trying to get going. Um, is, is unrealistic, but what I was hoping, I think, and even though I, I got my head around that, I've got my head around the fact that it's it's, it's not gonna be a destination we arrive at, but I, I was sort of hoping I think we'd at least find some people who are really super keen for this. And um, I, I feel like I haven't found them. I think as a community and as adults, we need to really work on coming out of our shells and making these things happen because we've got the tools there in the community to do it but it's us that has to make it work. So um, it's down to us to show these kids how it's done. Okay, uh, well, uh, we've still got a plan. We're gonna you know, go off on our tour of our neighborhood next and um, our kids are gonna take us on their tour of the neighborhood and, and then we're gonna do a bit of a neighborhood explore and, and then we're gonna do a bit of a wrap up and, and then um, sort of leave this neighborhood, this community you know, with, the, with the, the task of continuing to build. Um, so uh, yeah, well, we've, got, we've got a bit of a platform to go. Clearly, when people are feeling socially isolated, uh, this doesn't just have negative consequences for their health, their anxiety level goes up, there's an increased risk of depression. The Australian Psychological Society and Swinburne University published a report very recently is showing that one in four Australians feel lonely three or four days of every week. Uh, so that's a consequence. But there are other health consequences that flow from that, not just mental health. Increased risk of inflammation, hypertension, uh, deterioration of cognitive function, all sorts of things. Now, I've heard social analysts say, I'm not interested in my neighbours. My community is at work or my community is my friendship circle. Now. That to me is not just sad, even tragic, uh, but it's also dangerous for a society to lose the sense that the local neighborhood 
is the crucial social unit. Not that we're all going to be best friends, but when people say, I don't know my neighbors, they never say that with pleasure. They never say it with pride, as though I've been trying for years to not know my neighbors and I've finally achieved it. Of course not. They always say it wistfully, as though there's something wrong uh, with a society in which we could live next door to someone or even two or three doors away and not know them. Anyway, we carry on. Determined, we're going to continue this exploration and hopefully find a few new kids to join this neighbourhood gang. And while it wasn't an overwhelming number, we did indeed find two wonderful new kids to come with us and explore this neighbourhood. Ella, who is nine years old and lives right around the corner from James, and Bentley, a school friend of James. And yes, he is a member of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Hey James, we've got to chat about a few things before we head off. It's the first day of fall. <laughs> to help the kids gain an understanding of their neighbourhood, this session was all about visiting each other's houses and visiting a few spots that perhaps they'd seen and heard about in their estate to help them find their bearings in their home community. Since Bentley lived in another neighbourhood, that left us with just one nearby house to visit. So we rounded up the kids and we got ready to head off to Ella's place. There we go, look. Oh, oh, look at all that. There's about 40 on there. They're camouflaged. What type of fish are they? Camouflage fish. Camouflage fish. <laughs> so, Ella, yeah. want to show us around? Yes. Give us a tour. These are bins which stink a lot. Here are some plants that get rained on and this wall's gonna have something on it, like teapot things that Mum's gonna put on mm. to look beautiful. These are our washing. You just walk through there. We got a spa. Yeah, the swimming pool. It's a spa. And we got a trampoline. We got some yeah, pants. Yeah, like a bath outside. <laughs> um, and then Welcome to the bomb this is our <laughs> currently coming on. <laughs> the step on those. Who peed in there? Oh, the fish. I didn't know fish can pee. It's disgusting. They have to. What else do they do? Pee in the bush. In the bush. <laughs> After Ella's house, we continued the journey to explore the local bushland, and the kids led the way, and we took a back step, just offering some assistance and direction as needed. We wanted to give these kids a sense that they're owning this experience, which is important to make them feel connected and free like they own these streets. I liked it because we went and explored parts of Riverbank that I didn't know of and where the kangaroo's favourite spots are to poo and I never knew the poo was so big. See <laughs> what he's been eating. <laughs> Bentley's, Bentley's not a fan of the kangaroo tree. Why not here? And did you say you know other kids in your street? Yeah. And what are their names? Maddie and Imogen. Oh, Maddie and Imogen? Yeah. And they're the only ones you know of? Yeah. Do you think there's other kids in your street? No. I would say. No. The rest of them are just toddlers. Toddlers, ah, oh, okay, they're too young. So there are kids, but they're too little. Yeah. I really thought that it would be something really great for my kids to get to know more people in the neighbourhood uh, and an opportunity to see what's happening in the development too. So it would give them more time to stop and look at the smaller things. Within this development, the houses are much closer together. There's no yard space, so you're not playing in each other's yards like we used to. You're really reliant on that park. Can we play Trump <laughs> I do think that the houses are designed so that Everyone goes into their house, locks their box up, turns their aircon on and has nothing to do with anyone around them. And I think that that's right or wrong way, part of the way that society is going and also the way developments are designed. Ella's mum, Cairo, brought up a great point, house sizes. And we wanted to explore this a little bit deeper. Home ownership is, is, is as important to young families today as it was probably 50 years ago. So on a bright sunny day, we caught up with Michael Stone right in the heart of Brisbane. But with that affordability become smaller houses and smaller 
blocks of land, which is a is a trend that has probably uh, started, you know, some time ago, but certainly tangibly seen it in the last ten years. But certainly, from a design point of view, we won't create small lots or small houses. We crea create a broad reach of product. And in those areas where it's slightly more dense, we'll be providing far more amenity, whether it's walking distance to parks, whether it's a park across the road, whether it's direct access to public transport. So if they can't entertain 20 or 30 people in their backyard, they've certainly got a park there within easy walking distance to do the same thing. We spoke to Michael for a little while longer, and in all fairness, Riverbank Estate did tick all of the other boxes. Safety, parks, footpaths, bikeways, traffic calming, location and access. So we let Michael get back to building neighbourhoods and we carried on with our journey of getting kids out into them. Oh, look at that. Can you fix it? Do you want me to show you how? Alrighty. That's it, put it all on. Keep on going, push hard. Even a bit harder. You, you did it. Hey Ella, how you doing? Standing in the rain. You look prepared for everything. So you got that James, so whenever we get to a road crossing, we're just gonna stop and we're all gonna go together, all right? My old bike doesn't get that much use these days. Hang on James, we've had a crash. Oh no, your chain came off again. So today has been a bit of a mixed bag. I've had so much fun today. I'll be challenged as well, but you know, I've had a lot of fun uh, being led around this neighborhood by these kids, um, Ella, Bentley and James. Uh, we've had everything, we had it all. Uh, and it definitely has been a theme of danger and risk and fear facing. Look at you go, you are so strong. What were you worried about? The, what? It's too slippery. Mm. Fair enough, that's a good call. Uh, we've had um, cl high climbing of trees, high climbing on um, playgrounds, jumping up high things and getting progressively higher. Hey James, great work. I want mum to be here. Why do you want your mum to be here, James? So, wait, actually I don't. Oh. <laughs> we also had some go, bike riding down steep banks. We, nice work, James. I swore these kids were just gonna fall off and stack it and eat it. And, but they didn't, and they got back and had another crack. They got really excited by it. Here we go now. And she's so sensible. Well, like we got to this part in the path. The kids had turned on the grass, and she stops. I'm like, I'm not going on there. I'm like, well, it's going. I can't go on there. I'm like, why not? It says here on my sticker, this bike is not designed for off-road use or competitive <laughs> stunting. Oh, there's gold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, that's right. Be a rebel, right on the grass. <laughs> and the other thing was the, the cooperation and the, and, and, the, and the teamwork that was sort of evident today, especially with Ella. She's such a caring and considerate kid. I love it how this little, you know, stop turned into a team building activity, into a fear killing activity, to a, you know, all about confidence, those kids just mastered some skills, they got over this stuff real quick, they worked together. The whole behaviour's changed just in a few minutes. Just through that inconse inconsequential stop along the way. Amazing. Yeah. Here we go now. <laughs> We've also had emotional outbursts and fighting. And the kids have got past it. No, it feels to me like the, 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 the pull to keep on playing is so strong for those kids that they'll move past that, those emotional outbursts and, and to get back into that awesome, super fun, adventurous play. We've only got one session left. It's going to be a bit sad to finish up. It's been amazing. We're back. We made it. Mm -hmm. 
good fun. While we were approaching the final session with the Riverbank Kids Club, we began running these same sessions over with Marissa and her kids in Rainview. In a similar fashion to the first Riverbank session, it was again a really small turnout for the parent group chat. Once again, we were looking to get the permission of the parents to take their kids on an exploration of their neighbourhood. I must say, the difference in yard size was astronomical. There was no need for the kids to head to the park to play. They had their own amazing adventure playground right outside their back door. The starting point for the Rangeview Kids Play Network was Marissa's kids, Zayden and Mayla, and Sarah's little girl, Kaya. And she just lived right across the park. So the kids had a play, and I had a quick chat with Marissa and Sarah inside. The backyard is great for a while, and it satisfies our kids' play needs, and then suddenly it doesn't anymore. Yeah. And that's usually because they're growing, mm -hmm. and their world wants to grow with it. What we do is go to each other's houses, so the kids start to know where to, how to find each other. Yeah, my daughter would not know. Yeah, we're yeah. on the way here and she's like, where are we going? I said, Mayla's house. Have we ever been to Mayla's house? I said, no. She goes, have you ever been to Mayla's house? I said, no. She goes, how do you know where it is then? <laughs> and I said, well, I know. And she's like, ah. Oh. Your, your daughter's, you could access your daughter, I suppose, by going through the park. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this community, I think, has um, infrastructure wise, a lot going for it. These kids just need to find each other here and, and, and the family is talking more. There has definitely been a lot of good feedback from what has happened, like from the play day and stuff like that as well. Um, Mayla's even been talking to the saying, did you know that I can go down to the park on my own someday? <laughs> like, how would you feel about that? She's like, yeah, I want to do that. I'm like, well, it would have to be with a friend and that's something we can work towards. So she was pretty stoked about that. Wow, <laughs> that's great. We were gonna go with you guys on a neighborhood explore to each other's house. So we're gonna start here and we're gonna walk from Mayla and Zayden's place to Kaya's place. Now, there might be some other friends who come along too. Hannah's house. Yeah, we could and end up going to like, Hannah's house. And we, then we can get to my park. We could get distracted and end up at the park and maybe have a bit of a play there. So what do you guys think about that? Good. Cool. So, what do you think of this plan? Yeah, I think it's great. Yep. I love the idea. Okay. Yep. Everyone's all good with it? No concerns? No. no. It's not for a couple of weeks yet, so don't... don't. Get too excited. Well, you can get excited. That's okay. I like getting excited. Yes. But uh, but uh, it's just as long as you know it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's after the holidays. After the school holidays. But we'll be back, I promise. I, I'm pretty certain this neighbourhood could become a, a, a neighbourhood for kids to play. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm not sure how the dog feels about this plan. During the holidays, while the kids got excited about their first group explore around the Rangeview estate, we found ourselves reflecting on the obvious contrast between the Riverbank and the Rangeview estate. Ten years ago, when we first started looking at child development using what was then the Australian Early Development Index, we realised there was this interesting disconnect in some areas between socioeconomic status and child development. And it really started begging this question, what is it about a community that makes it good for kids and particularly good for child development? So what is it about where you live that makes a difference? Sharon headed up a cross-disciplinary team that developed a draft manual which helps to measure the capacity of the community to support a child's development. The measure introduces 13 foundational community factors. So there are certain things that, for example, fit into the socioeconomic domain, which was around income diversity, even within a low income band. Um, things like public housing and the amount of public housing and the density of public housing. Social factors like stigma. So stigma, not surprisingly, is associated with poorer child development outcomes. I decided to explore the data for our two neighbourhoods. And interestingly, there were a few points of difference in our communities. While there was no public housing in Rangeview Estate, Riverbank had a 6.7% rate, which is fairly significant number. And what we had found throughout our discussions and explorations, that a definite stigma was present, more so in the Riverbank community, with trends related to drug use, crime, hooning, and domestic violence. Their perception of crime, and the fear that goes alongside that, was pretty evident. Seemingly, in the Rainview Estate, at least by comparison, 
the stigma was lower. I think this ability to be able to compare communities that seem so different on so many levels and you would think the community that was wealthier and had a perception of low crime would be able to allow children in the street and to play, and they're not. And I think, I don't have the answers to all of that, except to say there's clearly a barrier that's either the same or really important to both of those communities, or maybe they're completely different barriers. And what a great question to be able to try and uncover. So, along came our walk to explore the neighbourhood with our little gang, Mela, Zayden and Kaya, a small but mighty gang. Hey, so kids, where are we going? To my house. Bob. To your house? Yeah. To your house, are you excited? Yeah. I don't think you're excited enough. But you look pretty excited though. <laughs> so uh, which way is your house? That way. Oh, you ready to go right now? All right, we're going. <laughs> See you later, parents. Are you going to say goodbye to your parents? Bye, bye. 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 All right. Bye, bye, bye. Cool. Bye, bye. See you soon. Bye. See you later. First stop, we're off to Kaya's house, which was so incredibly close. But this would be the first time that these girls have made this journey to each other's house. You are the leaders, we don't even know where we're going. There's figs on this tree. We discovered a path directly across the road, which led into this huge green space that connected all of the surrounding houses. These things are so yummy. You guys could show us all the cool things that we could see along the way as well. Or you guys want, you just want to go straight to Kaya's house. Yeah, these are both our dams. No, they're not your dam, they're the part of Chris's dam. So when we arrived, Kaya gave us an introduction to her dogs in her backyard and we had a look around the outside of her house. This is your house, Kaya? Yeah. You have a little swimming pool with a slide. That is super cool. Mm -hmm. So that um, house is Maddie. She goes to our school. How old's Maddie? Um, I don't know, but that's Mrs. Walmer's house. Over there, that's living Steve's house with my next door neighbours. Uh, do they have kids? Um, no. No? Nope. Is there any kid, other kids in this street? <laughs> While she did know her immediate neighbours by name, and she knew a little bit about them, which was great, Kaya hadn't really explored much further afield and wasn't super aware where to find any kids nearby. It's probably going to be a long walk though. So we kept wandering. We had plenty of time up our sleeves and the girls thought they knew where they could find some school friends in the area. And so, the mission began to find Ella's house. I'm totally sure that this is a house. Pretty sure. But I remember that she has a little circle of windows. No, a little circle like that, like that, like that, and there's like windows so that. My bad, that was the wrong house. I saw that, I saw the person, I'm like, whoopsies, don't be mad at me, don't be mad at me, I'm so sorry. Maybe it's this house. Let's just knock. Knock. I know, we're not gonna knock on the door. So I'm thinking that we could have to check every single house with the fence and the blue roof. Though it didn't really result in any success in finding Ella or any other kids playing, we did enjoy our walk together and had a good chat with Kaya and Mayla about street etiquette. Mayla reckons you need to be 13 and Kaya said 17 years old before you're ready to cross the road on your own. Hey, what do you do? First, you look both sides two times. Okay. One, two, one, two. Then you safely cross the road. And you don't run across the road. Yeah. Only if it's a car coming. You're, you're not 17 and you just cross the road without an adult. <laughs> <laughs> During our short walk around the neighbourhood, these guys, they were really blown away by what they saw. Zayden really enjoyed his stick he found. What a trooper. He's just waltzing around the neighbourhood happy as Larry. And my horse. We also came across some pretty wild spaces that we continue to explore. Maybe this is a path to the dam because I can see a dam down there. I'd be willing to say that some of these moments today will be pretty fond memories for these kids. Early in the day, the girls were in a hurry to get from point A to point B. But as the day progressed, it was great to see them thinking creatively about what they can do out in their neighbourhoods, especially in nature. Well, it's right we can we could shop somewhere and make a little bench and we can make things like I did. And by the end of the day, the girls were really starting to take the lead. You know how you're going to get to my house and you know there's uh, another lane if you just keep on going forward? Yep. Yeah, that's where we're going to go. Excellent.
We even picked up a new friend. Good to see the local dogs have no issues with roaming distance. Guys, we found a dog here and I think it lives here. And I don't know if it's a boy or girl, but I named it Big Mac. He is in our heart. We want to keep him and he is in our family. This neighbourhood explore really highlighted just how quickly these kids felt a sense of belonging and ownership of their local area. What a great time. People often say that play is frivolous or trivial, and I am going to suggest that they're right. It is, it's trivial. It's trivial because it doesn't get you anything. There's a certain sense in which it doesn't count, but it's precisely because it doesn't count that play is such a powerful vehicle for learning. This is really the, the most delicious paradox of play, that the enormous educative power of play lies in its triviality. It's because play doesn't count that children are free to try new things. This is the, this is the best situation for them, to learn new things, to do things that are frightening to them in the real world, and to be able to think out of the box, be able to think creatively. Go for it, lead the way. So play is trivial, but it is not easy. And the reason it isn't easy is because as soon as it gets easy, it gets boring and it's no longer play anymore. And then the child goes on to something more difficult. Play is only fun when it's challenging. Play, children are always at the cutting edge of their physical and mental abilities when they are playing. That little girl is climbing as high as she can in the tree and while keeping her, her mental state. And this is true really of every, every kind of play. So what a really cool adventure. I had a blast, so much fun today. I was pretty blown away by the, the greenness of this neighborhood and the high adventure potential this place has. We had stacks, you know, poor old Zayden smashed his chin and his knee. Oh, he's down. Oh, he slipped. Got him. Got a little bark off your knee. He showed us how resilient he is and how he could pick himself up and keep on going. Like I was, I was sort of thought that could go well either way. Oh yeah, because if mine? you're not going to fall, yeah, you're obviously not. Playing hard enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got moon scars from when I was a kid. But that's just part and parcel, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think fear is a barrier for other parents? Yeah, definitely. They're too scared to let the kids fall. Mm. Oh, don't climb that tree, you might fall. Yeah, they might fall, but that's how they learn. I, I remember when um, I took Zayden to the school and he was up on the playground and he was like right near the edge and Zayden was very young and he was he's always been a kid to climb everything. But I had so many parents who were just hovering around him and they're like how can you be so calm? I'm like, he's he's always done this. He's always been climbing, so he knows his limits and knows what he can and can't do. And that's, that's how he learns. We are continually raising a generation of risk-averse, anxious children who have low resilience, which feeds into poor mental health. Uh, you know, they lack confidence, they lack self-efficacy. They don't know what their capabilities are sometimes because they've never really been allowed to explore them. There's a massive body of research looking at this parenting style, which is all about sort of helicopter parenting and anxiety and fear and preventing the child. And you're actually stunting the child's cognitive and emotional, psychological growth. You're stunting it very, very badly. As a parent myself, I do battle with the question of where do we draw the line? And what is the limit? And what do we constitute as safe? Or what we perceive as safe? And what if something goes wrong when our kids are playing? I do battle with these questions every day, but it's like Dr. Sharman said, if we hold on too tight to our kids, it's not the physical dangers, but the emotional scars that will begin to show. All right, let's do it. We're right. This is the most dangerous thing I ever seen in my life. The water's changed. And it's all freaking really, really slippery. Is it? And very deep. Promise me you'll never do this without a big person. Yep, I'm gonna do it. Promise? I promise we're gonna whisper. Oh, we're nearly there. Oh, 
talking about this one, it's like, I need to go and wash my legs on the other side though again. What was the promise you made me? Never to go. Thank you, that and that. Good stuff. Oh, that is totally in hell. Well, I can't say that I wasn't challenged during this session. During our explore, one of the most awesome experiences was finding that eel swimming along the waterway. And naturally, one of the kids suggested that I should touch its tail. Me? Why me? <laughs> <laughs> How sharp are their teeth? You know what? I'm gonna respect this, its journey that it's on and let it just <laughs> do what it's doing. <laughs> I can't pick that up. I, I'm scared of that. Well, what was it that Peter Gray said? It's not play unless it's challenging, right? After a couple of short hours, and literally just one or two kilometers that we traveled from home, we had been on a jam-packed adventure, and it was time to roll back around the lake and head home back to Mailer and Zayden's house. That's a swing! A swing! It's the call of the children. Come out, children, wherever you are. So we got through the session after an exhilarating day of crashes, eels, wild cherry tomatoes, tunnels, fear, fun, freedom, fluency, challenge of the highest degree. Wow. So here we are. We spent three very eye-opening sessions with the Riverbank Kids Club and the Rangeview Kids Play Network. And nearly 10 months on from where we first start this journey, that brings us to our final sessions. From a logistical perspective, it hasn't been an easy task to coordinate these sessions. Parents are busy, schedules clash, and priorities change. But you could imagine our excitement when we arrived to see that our little gangs had grown in numbers for our final adventure together. It just goes to show that momentum is beginning to build in these communities outside of our sessions. Having a larger group meant that Mela, Zayden and Kaya became the leaders and they could show these kids around their natural world that they already knew. It's amazing how they've gone straight into building things. Like, build, we need to build this, we need to build that. Put up a house, and make a couch out of the moss, and put up a roof, a table. It's cool. When I stood and watched, I could picture these kids playing together in the future. The group growing in size, creating that safety in numbers. With older kids looking out for the younger kids, I certainly took a lot of enjoyment from that thought. And those kids looking down from their houses, well, let's hope it's only a matter of time and they'll be joining these kids for all the fun. With the Riverbank kids, well... We had a bit of a rocky start, with James having an epic meltdown. But again, as the day progressed, we saw the calming power of nature. The Riverbank kids session went off-road. We went further afield than we'd ever explored. The creek and the bushes were hidden gems and gave the younger children an avenue to push their boundaries and explore. We played on dirt mounds and steep river banks, we flew down hills on bikes, we laughed, we cried and we screamed. Hello! Oh, I'll stay down here. With the Rangeview kids, what started off as a separation between the girls and the boys eventually dissolved into an open, free-for-all, collaborative nature play. 
we had a sit down with some of the kids at the end to wrap up and reflect on their journey. I asked the kids, if you could create your perfect neighbourhood, what would you have in it? I would have houses, but I wouldn't have them so close together. So can I have some breeze come through? I'd have park bikes like this and lots of obstacle courses. I would have a little big studio and you could come and you could do art clubs. There would be exploring, there'd be planting. Ella's response was so creative and happy and community orientated. I'd love to live in her make-believe village. Yeah, so there'll be like lots of children around, lots of families. One of the boys who came yeah. along with us today was Benjamin. He gave a really interesting comment around the use of technology in his perfect neighbourhood. And in my neighbourhood there'll be like no computers. Because I think computers and yeah, computers in general and phones are the root of all evil. Why, why do you say that? Because it looks like children don't communicate with their parents on their phones. Like, they just keep texting. Yeah. It's amazing that at Ben's age, that the use of technology or the dangers associated with technology are so prominent in his thinking. It doesn't agitate me, it makes me feel sad. Um, so yeah, many years ago my partner and I were at, uh, at, a, at a cafe and we saw two parents turn up with a two-year-old child. The parents sat down and played on their phones and they handed the ch child an iPad at breakfast. No one looked at each other, they all sat there and played on their devices. And I just thought, wow, that kid's going to have really, really problematic social skills <laughs> when they grow up. Uh, if your parents won't even talk to you, if they're not even interested in engaging with you, looking you in the eye, expressing emotions, having you learn what those emotions mean, having you mirror that back. Time and time again, we're hearing this concept around kids spending way too much time on screens. They found 75% of kids are exceeding the daily screen use, 71% are using a second device while watching TV, one in five are using it at a dinner table. Almost 40% are falling asleep with the device. And the average child above five does four and a half hours of screen time a day. And then we end up with this. One third almost now of Australian kids are either overweight or obese. There are signs out there that things are getting quite dire for some children. Look, if we cut play off, I think we're going to see what we're already seeing, which is sort of what I tend to call a bit I suppose along the lines of kind of the autistification of a generation, we are seeing very high levels of low social skills, poor empathy, which by the way is one of the core features of autism. I'm not saying this is causing autism, but my goodness, it's giving rise to something that looks an awful lot like it, and there's an awful lot of them. There's a couple of European clinical psychologists who have uh, really <laughs> interestingly started to incorporate nature play uh, and getting outside and off screens as part of their treatment for autism. Now, I don't want to get into who did the diagnosis or what have you, but I've actually been contacted by some of those professors to say, this is actually now their kind of first port of call. So you have a kitty who is apparently autistic. Fine, get them off the screens, get them outside, get them socialising, let's see what happens. And some of these kitties absolutely remediate. Okay, so this has been like an, almost an artificial autism, if you like, that's been caused or created by this on screen, no social skills, poor empathy, you know, all the stuff that, that uh, relates to that particular condition. I think if, if, if this sort of childhood continues and we cut play out of it, we are going to continue to see this sort of autistification of children and adults. They're going to be low socially skilled, they're going to have poor empathy, poor theory of mind and you know become intensely sort of polarised and angry about everything because ultimately they don't really know how to work as a member of the human race. There are only so many hours in the day. Time spent on screens is time not spent playing with friends and not supporting all those relevant skills to support a healthy childhood. Why were we doing this? Mm, so we can make friends. And why did we want to make friends? So the neighbourhood's happy. Do you reckon it would be cool to come down here with our new grown-ups? Would you come here and hang out here? Yeah. What would you do down here? I would probably bring a picnic. Bring a picnic and do what? 
I'll bring my family here. Bring your family, but you don't have to bring grown ups. I know, but I want to bring my family. Oh, that's Probably my daddy and my mummy. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> when you're playing with friends, how does that make you feel? Mm, happy. Happy. Looking back at the original goal that we set ourselves for the start of this neighbourhood play project, which was to see if we could find families who would be actually willing to go with us on a journey and try and activate their neighbourhoods as a place for the kids to play. Looking back, it's been a series of successes and failures. But either way, we've learned some extremely valuable lessons that will help us better shape our neighbourhoods into the communities that our kids need. So what do we now know? Concern for children's inability to access local friends is high. Parents want strong local networks and connected neighbours. And time poor parents, they have lots on their plates. Perhaps the truth of it is, somehow this has just slipped off our radar and is no longer a priority for us. If it just was every Saturday, one yeah. kid turns up with a parent, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like once it's established too, I think that it'll be something that people make time for. And that becomes their priority rather than it sort of be something that you just kind of fit in then they, you know, they want to catch up with their friends and they want to go exploring, so it becomes, yeah. Intrinsically motivated kids exactly. wanting it yeah, to happen. Exactly. I definitely want to go down this. Hey, I think that's you know, a really great point that was made, regardless whether or not you get one parent or, or another kid out. I suppose getting out is into the neighbourhood and, and familiarising your kid with your neighbourhood and is, is an important thing to do. And, um, Mailer and Ziggy have definitely built a stronger understanding of, of how awesome their neighbourhood is for them as a play resource. So, for the local neighbourhood children in this project, we succeeded in many ways. We connected a group of local children in both neighbourhoods. We showed them how to access each other by foot. We gave them direct experiences and awareness of their areas. We familiarised them with the local wild spaces for adventure. And we built neighbourhood fun files in their brains to keep them wanting more. This is the last day. Yeah, there's no more adventures with Fiona and Miranda. Uh, I really want to do some more, six more. Inside or outside? What would you rather do? Outside. Why? Outside, because it's way more fun now. Way and more. you can actually sleep outside. Really? Ted. Yeah, of course. Learning at school is one thing, but actually being in the environment and learning from it, in it, is it's just a whole nother And level. I also don't think they actually know what they're missing out on either. Yeah. Like, yeah. they don't know what, what is out here. Yeah. For the grown-ups, the ripple effects have been positive. They now have ongoing communication channels. They're connecting, talking and bonding. They have a shared language around the importance of neighbourhood play. They also have a deep understanding of all the barriers that surround this issue. They're building local identity. Local neighbourhood play champions are forming. It's built more confidence in myself. Um, I talk a lot more out in the, in, to the neighbours now. I'm, I'm not so shy and standoff as like, should I say hi or shouldn't I? <laughs> We've got other members of the community now that want to do stuff as well and they've come up with some great ideas. So we're looking at craft groups and fitness groups for the adults and yeah, it's going it's to be, um, be good. For the neighbourhood children, sadly, we failed them in many ways too. Only a small amount of children ever took part. And we never found out why most of these kids chose not to come out and play. And we didn't secure a neighborhood full of children who play outdoors all the time. And we didn't cater for the amount of time, persistence, patience, and consistency it takes to change the culture and build a new story of neighborhood play. And we didn't discover the reasons why neighborhood play is not a priority for most. Oh, <laughs> Oh, oh. Who, who would you give one to? Ben Luke. Yeah, but he doesn't live in your neighbourhood, so you can't call him, because they only work a certain distance. Of all these failures, I feel like my biggest was I didn't find a local friend for James. While I now know this outcome was largely beyond my control, James so desperately wants a local play buddy to run around and muck around with, to wrestle and climb and yell and scream and explore and face challenges with, just to be a kid. He desperately needs a local play friend to support him as he grows. I so wanted this for James. My hope for James is that he finds at least one regular play friend very soon. I can confidently state now that there are two fundamental human behaviors preventing children from being able to play. 
and this is trust and fear. We have an issue with trust, an overwhelming lack of it, and this is what we need to start rebuilding for the benefit of our kids. When did we decide that we're all so untrustworthy? I mean, I consider myself trustworthy, and I imagine you do too. Which brings us to the other central issue impacting on our children's neighbourhood play, fear. There seems to be an overwhelming consensus among our communities that we are all in constant danger all the time. Where did this come from? The 24-hour news cycle in our pocket constantly reminds us that unfortunate events occur. I am not safe, my neighbourhood is not safe, and everyone I don't know is a threat. These are the messages our children are processing. I'm not saying bad things don't happen, and that consequences could be terrible, but is being safe all there is to life? And is being safe the best part of living? Our fear and our trust issues are impacting on our children's health and well-being their sense of community, their connection with nature, their interest in the world beyond their front door, and even their overall trust in their fellow human. The most powerful lesson from this project is that the antidote to fear is hope. This hope grows out of a series of small but independent local steps. When we think of facing a nationwide culture of fear, the task does seem insurmountable, but what we have come to understand from this project is the answer is simple and it's easy and it's very, very rewarding and it starts locally. In fact, right next door. All we need to do is to make regular time to get out into our neighbourhoods. Start saying hello to our neighbours. Familiarise our children with their community. For Tracy and Marissa, this neighbourhood play project has given them a practical way forward, a sense of local agency that they can make a difference, a real way to make change with immediate and measurable results. We have all been changed as a result of this Neighbourhood Play project. There's no turning back for us. My hopes have also changed. I now hope that this Neighbourhood Play project, Tracy and Marissa and their family stories, serve as an enlightening tale of hope and inspiration. And I hope their story connects us with the humanness that seems to be missing from most of our neighbourhoods these days. But it's easily revived by just simply saying, hello. So, do you know where all the kids are in your neighbourhood? And how many doors are you going to knock on to revive neighbourhood play in your area? Ah, oh, g'day. I'm Payano. I'm your neighbour.